I'm, 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 I have too much nervous energy. Good evening, so, uh, everyone. I'm proven. Steve Crouch, Dean of the College of Science and Engineering. On behalf of the University of Minnesota, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 10th annual Irving and Edith Meisel, Meisel Family Lecture in Theoretical Physics. I've had the honor of giving brief ceremonial openings for most of the previous lectures in this series, and it's a pleasure to be able to do so again tonight. Mrs. Meisel and her late husband endowed this lecture series to honor their family's longtime friendship with William and Bianca Fine, the benefactors of the William I. Fine Theoretical Physics Institute in our School of Physics and Astronomy. Mrs. Meisel and Dr. Bianca Fine are in attendance tonight, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank them for their thoughtful and generous gifts. Yeah. For a number of years, the College of Science and Engineering has been making special efforts to promote science to the general public through lectures such as the one you'll hear tonight. In this regard, I especially want to welcome those of you who've come here from outside the university. We're happy that you could join us tonight. Professor Keith Olive, director of the Fine Theoretical Physics Institute, will introduce tonight's distinguished speaker. But before asking him to do so, I would like you to join me once again in thanking Mrs. Meisel and Dr. Fine for their support of theoretical physics at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> Professor Olive. Good evening. It's, it's so nice to see so many people with uh, interest in theoretical physics. Uh, I'd like to say a few words, just this, a little bit to set the stage for our speaker, Professor uh, Polchinski, and what he's going to talk about to you today. There are, there are four forces in nature, and we always hear about forces, but there are four fundamental forces in nature. There are two nuclear forces, they're called the weak and the strong force. Uh, to put in other language that control fission and fusion, which might also not mean a lot to everybody, but one makes big bonds, the other makes bigger bonds, and I think everybody <laughs> knows about that. There's also electricity and magnetism, that we all have everyday experience with. And then there's gravity, and that we might not think about, but more so even than electricity and magnetism, that affects our every minute of our lives because we're stuck to the, to the planet. And surprisingly, gravity is a big puzzle. It's the, it's the, it's of all the forces, it's the one that we understand the least. And to try and have an understanding at the same level that we have of the other forces, we have to go beyond our normal notion of gravity and blend it in with quantum mechanics. And there are not very many ways to understand that, and one way to understand that is a theory called string theory. And actually, to be literal, Professor Polchinski wrote the book on string theory. I, again, literally he wrote the book. Now, Physics is an experimental science, and now he's getting nervous. Physics is an experimental science, and the question is now, how do you test a theory like string theory? So experimental science means you have a theory, you go out and do a, an experiment, and you test if the theory is right, and if the experiment says so, then, then you accept the theory and you move on. If the experiment says it's wrong, you, you also move on and you discard the theory. So, and that's what happened, for example, in the first test of gravity when you went from Newton to Einstein. Now, Einstein had it easy. I mean, he might not have thought so at the time, but he had it easy. He developed a, a theory beyond Newton's theory of gravity, which is called general relativity. And general relativity made a number of tests. He proposed a number of tests. And there were high precision tests. And, for example, one was that Einstein's theory predicted that the precession of mercury, the 
planet Mercury around the sun uh, deviates a little bit by about 43 seconds of arc per century. Now, if you don't know what I'm saying, an arc, a, a second of arc is uh, a sixtieth of a minute of arc, and a minute of arc is a sixtieth of a degree, and of course there are 360 degrees in a circle. So you can imagine this is 43 seconds per century. He also predicted that the deflection of light around the sun to be about a little bit less than two seconds of arc. And these are very, very tiny amounts, but they were still testable. And so that was what made general relativity such a big success because you were able to test it and prove that it, it seems to be correct. Now, at some level, it's not going to be correct. We know it's going to break down at some point. And as I said, string theory is one candidate theory, probably the best candidate theory, uh, to go beyond general relativity. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to test it experimentally. And so you have to move your lab, instead of being an experimental lab, to be a theoretical lab. And that theoretical lab that we're going to hear about tonight is using black holes to, to do your experiments. And so what we'll hear about is using black holes to test quantum mechanics and general relativity. And I think in particular we're going to hear about the idea of information loss. And so when you say, what does that mean? Well, imagine you're, 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 you're throwing something in a black hole and if, if you know anything about black holes, you, you think no, nothing comes back out of a black hole. Well, in that case, you would lose some information. You throw some sort of particles into a black hole and you no longer know anything about those. And when I first heard about information loss years and years ago, I had a discussion with uh, a friend and colleague of mine who's actually also a colleague of Professor Polchinski at Santa Barbara. His name is Mark Srednicki. And I asked him about this, about what kind of information are we talking about? Are we talking about just, well, you have a certain number of particles that you're throwing in? And he said, well, no, 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 it's much more intricate than that. Imagine that you throw the white pages, and for some of the younger members of the audience, white pages used to be a book that had phone numbers in it. We would throw the white pages into, the, into a black hole, and can you get the phone numbers back out from the radiation that Professor Pachinsky will tell us about? So let me go on to just introduce our speaker now. Professor Polchinski got his undergraduate degree in 1975 from Caltech, his PhD in 1980 from Berkeley. Uh, he did postdocs at uh, Stanford, at SLAC, and at Harvard. His uh, first faculty position was at the University of Texas in Austin, and then he moved to the University of California at Santa Barbara to the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics. As I said earlier, he's, a, he's the author of a textbook on, st on string theory. He won the Heinemann Prize for Mathematical Physics in 2007, the Dirac Medal in 2008, and the Physics Frontier Prize in 2013 and 2014. He's a member of the, Academy, uh, uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And so with that, let me present Professor Joseph Polchinski. Uh, so, is this on? so thank you, Keith, for the very detailed and useful introduction. Thank you all for being here. It's great to see such a large audience. And also, it's been great to meet members of the Fine and Mizell family and to hear about their great support for what we do. So I'm going to be talking about a conflict, a conflict between two of our great laws of science, our theory of the very large and our theory of the very small. And it might look like a rather uneven battle, but the fact is it's gone back and forth and we still don't know how it's going to turn out. And it's a very exotic battle because it's, fought, it's being fought in, in, in exotic environments like the event horizon of a black hole. So I'll start with a couple of quotes. The first one is from Albert Einstein. Uh, God does not play dice with the world. So what Einstein was complaining about was quantum mechanics. When you hear that an atom is an electron or, or several electrons circling around the nucleus, you might picture something like what you see on the left, a solar system with a nice circular orbit. 
but the truth is what's on the right. Uh, if you go looking for the electron, you cannot predict where it will be. You can only say where it might be, where it is likely to be, and this is that probability cloud. And this is a, this is a, a, a feature of nature which is just true. It bothered Einstein, but we now know that it works. It accounts for our understanding of atoms, our understanding of molecules, our understanding of, of matter. Um, so, so apparently, well, apparently there is this basic randomness in nature. The second quotation is from Albert Einstein, oh, sorry, from, from Stephen Hawking 50 years later, and what it says is that, string, that, 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 that things are even worse than Einstein had feared because God not only plays dice, he sometimes throws the dice where they cannot be seen. And, and so this second quotation is really what my talk is about, and it's, it ignited this conflict between these two theories. But before I get to black holes and, 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 and all of that, and what happens when you fall into a black hole, I want to talk, I want to sort of, you know, set the stage. Theoretical physics is kind of exotic, especially the kind of theoretical physics that I do. And so I want to give you some sense, the big picture of what we're trying to do and how and why. So about 100 years ago, we had three big revolutions in physics. We had special relativity, general relativity, and quantum mechanics. And these changed the way that we think about space and time and gravity and matter, and even about reality itself, that, that bit with the dice. And 100 years later, 100 years later, these three theories, these three principles still define the way we think about all of those things, space and time and so on. Um, but our work wasn't done 100 years ago because these principles were discovered one at a time. And what was found is that they don't fit together very easily. That, 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 that if you try to look for a theory that incorporates, well, the two relativity principles are fine, they come together. But if you try to find a theory that incorporates both quantum mechanics and the relativity principles, it's very hard, there are problems. Much of the physics of the last, much of the fundamental physics of the last hundred years has been to really to fit together these principles. And today, we are still in the middle of that. So um, let's actually start with, with so, 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 special, so good. Special relativity sort of takes over when things are moving very fast. So what these principles each say is that when you go to exotic, um, to, to, to unusual environments, uh, things become unfamiliar. They behave in surprising ways. So, so special relativity takes over when things are moving very fast. General relativity takes over when you have very massive things and quantum mechanics takes over when things are very small. So now you can ask the question, what if something is both very fast and very small? What if we have both special relativity and quantum mechanics operating at the same time? So um, this, um, what you see at the top of the slide is known as Schrodinger's equation. Now you're not supposed to have equations in a public lecture. So you can think about this as a piece of art. But it's a very useful piece of art because it allows us to calculate the properties of atoms and molecules and most ordinary matter to pretty good precision. But it has a problem because if you apply this equation to particles that are moving very fast, close to the speed of, close to the speed of light, it is wrong. It does not incorporate, it does not incorporate the, the, the special relativity principle. And so this fellow, Paul Dirac, fiddled with it, fiddled with it a bit and found a better equation, the Dirac equation, another piece of art on the bottom there, which, agree, which, which is the same as a Schrodinger equation if you're moving slowly, but which correctly incorporates the special relativity principle. And it's, it is the more correct description of nature. But he also got a bonus. Um, the bonus is that when he looked at the equation, it had twice as many solutions as he expected. It had the solutions that he expected to find that it described ordinary matter, and then another set that described nothing that anybody had ever seen before. And it took him a little while to realize that he was predicting something very new. He was predicting antimatter. 
he was predicting this for every known particle, there was another particle with the opposite properties. And, and this was radical at the time. Those days, things moved very fast, and this was predicted, this was actually confirmed, rather, by observation a couple of years later. Um, this, if this, this track you see here, uh, if it, uh, when, you, when you know how to interpret these, these diagrams, is actually the track of an antimatter particle, a positron moving in, in the detector. So, so this, this example has many morals. One of them is, again, um, how, what you, that you learn new things when you fit these principles together. Uh, one of them is the power of mathematics, that, that, that as our physical theories have become more complete, mathematics is a powerful tool in fitting them together. And one of them is that mathematics can lead you to things that you didn't expect to learn. So this was the story, again, of, the special, of special relativity and quantum mechanics. And it actually went on. It didn't end with Dirac. Um, it first of all required that we develop an entire new mathematical language. But also, it led to a lot more. So a few years ago, you, may, you very likely heard about the discovery of the Higgs boson, this fantastic achievement um, um, at CERN where they discovered um, this particle which is, plays a vital role in our theory of matter. Um, but as a theorist, I'm very proud because the theorists predicted this particle more than 50, mo almost 50 years before it was discovered. In fact, about 40 years ago, we put together the, the theory of matter, the standard model, and it predicted not one, but five new particles, as you see here. And one by one, these have been discovered. And, and the fact that, that it was possible to make such precise predictions, not just that the particles exist, but that they exist with very specific properties, it is largely because special relativity and, and, and quantum mechanics fit together only in a very special way. And so when you, when you figure out how they fit together, you learn a lot about nature and you can predict a lot. So those are two of the three principles, but the third principle, so and, and, and Keith mentioned the four forces. So this theory covers three of the, three of the four forces, electricity and magnetism, that's one force, and the two nuclear forces. But the fourth force, gravity, is really the hard one. And so that's the third principle, general relativity. And so, um, now, you might, we can ask the question, what happens if we have something which is both very massive and very small, and maybe also very fast? Now, that, that sounds like it's hard to do. How, does, how, how can something be very, both very massive and both very small? Well, it can happen, but only in very special environments. And so that's one of the things that makes this subject so theoretical at this point. The environments where these two things are both happening are, are extremely special. One of them would be particle collisions at very high energies. So um, the way particle experimentalists look for new laws of physics, new particles, is they, very simple, they bang things together as hard as they can and see what happens. And here's a picture of one of those events, and it's one of the events, in fact, in which the Higgs boson was seen. Um, but if you were able to do this at much higher energy, much harder, you would start to get into the regime where, where um, you have both the very small and the very massive. But right now, we, we're not close to being able to do that, so it's a theoretical activity. The second place is the early moments of the Big Bang. The universe is getting larger, uh, meaning that in the past it was smaller. Everything was pressed much more closely together. And we can follow this back in time an extraordinarily long distance. Um, we, we, the universe is now 13 some odd billion years old, but we can follow the expansion backwards to a time when the universe was less than a second old, and that's both theoretically and observationally. And, and so as you move into the past, things become, again, much smaller and closer together, and again, eventually you reach a point where quantum mechanics and general relativity have to both be taken into account. And, and the third regime where things are both very massive and very small is near black holes, especially the singularity of a black hole, which I'll say much more about, but the place where all of the mass of a collapsing star ends up, uh, all this mass in a very small point, and again, you have these two you know, large, and massive and small at the same time. And so these are laboratories, both experimental and theoretical, where, where these theories will come together. Now, now my, 
my talk started with this, so I was telling you there's a conflict, but I actually want to tell you, before I get to the conflict, I want to, I want to emphasize that, that to a certain extent these theories fit together just fine, and one of the great discoveries in modern physics, the great realizations, comes from fitting these two theories together. So here's a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, a field of galaxies, each of those little blurs is billions of stars. And you can ask the question, why are there galaxies, why are there clumps, bright things, instead of just a uniform gas? Um, why are the galaxies at all? And also, what determines the pattern? How big the galaxies are, how far apart, how many of them? And the answer, remarkably, we now know, is quantum mechanics, the theory of the very small. Every bright galaxy you see on that screen started out as one of these tiny random fluctuations. I talked about randomness on my very first slide with the, with the quotes. Every one of these galaxies started out as one of these tiny random fluctuations uh, which, had, which then expanded uh, with, the, with the growth of the universe and also collapsed due to the force of gravity to produce what we see. And this, of course, isn't just words. Uh, it's precise theory and precise measurements. Here's a, another picture of kind of the early radiation that preceded the galaxies. And here's a more precise graph that matches the spectrum of that radiation to theory. And you can, well, I guess you can see it. You can see how the, um, the green theory and the red observations uh, fit remarkably well. So this is a great triumph of science, and it's a place where, where, um, where these two theories work together quite well. But, you know, th this pattern formed sometime in the first second after the Big Bang. Not sure exactly when, but we really want to push, push back even further. We'd like to push back to time zero. One of the many things we would like is a theory of how the Big Bang began. And when we do this, we reach a point where our existing theories break down. So this is, this is one of our goals. Okay, so here is the, the exotic environment that, um, that we're gonna be talking about. Um, so, so black holes, well black holes are fantastic for modern science, both because they've been discovered, they're all over the place, so they're, 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 they're important both for real observations but also as an arena for thought experiments, for the things that we need to do. Um, and so, to explain thought experiments, before I get to black holes, I wanna make one more historic aside and talk about another example of how a thought, well, how, how a, what, experiment, what a thought experiment is and how it works. So, um, these equations are known as Maxwell's equations, and again, there's more equations, but it's okay because they're on a t-shirt. Um, and um, so these are Maxwell. Maxwell lived in the mid 1800s. When Maxwell was a boy, actually, his T-shirt didn't look like this. Um, th there, there was a missing term there. I, I like to hear, and people don't laugh enough at this point because, of course, people didn't wear T-shirts with equations in the 1800s. But it's, it's um, anyway. Anyway, the important thing is when he, when he, when Maxwell began, the equations were incomplete. And actually, these equations were discovered by experimentalists. Um, they, 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 the different terms have names. There's Gauss's law, which says that electric charges produce electric fields. There, there's Ampere's law, which says that, that currents produce magnetic fields. Um, and then there's Faraday's law, which, which actually, actually, I should say that originally people didn't know that electricity and magnetism had anything to do with each other. One of the big themes in science is, is that it, as we understand things, things that seem different turn out to be the same. And with electricity and magnetism, there are these connections. Electric currents produce magnetic fields, and Faraday's law, magnetic fields can produce electric fields. So they start to fit together. But these equations can't be enough. They're, these equations as they stand are, are physically and mathematically nonsensical. And, and Maxwell and others kind of exposed that with a thought experiment. And it's a very simple thought experiment. Um, you, you simply have a, a simple current, just a wire here, with some kind of source of an alternating current, an AC current, and you have a break in the wire, a capacitor, and you simply ask the question, what is the magnetic field where the X is? And if you use those equations that I had on the previous slide, the ones that were incomplete, they give 
if you, they, give, they don't give an answer. They give different answers depending on which equations you use. So there was something wrong. In fact, when this is taught in the physics sequence, it's often taught in this way, that the equations that you got from experiment were not complete. There was something missing. And, and, and Maxwell was able to figure out what the missing term was. The reason, by the way, that this missing term, which is this one, was discovered by a theorist and an experimentalist is because the alternating current that you need was just way too high frequency. You couldn't do the experiment then. But by imagining the experiment and seeing that it gave an, a result you couldn't understand, he could deduce this extra term. And so now these two electricity and magnetism are connected together even more tightly. This says magnetic fields make electric fields. This says electric fields make magnetic fields. And so you can get kind of a self-sustaining thing where you start with a magnetic field. Faraday's law produces an electric field. Maxwell's law produces a magnetic field. And on and on forever. And what you produce is something which is a wave. And it's a wave that moves with the speed of light. And, and in fact, what Maxwell had done is he had explained surprisingly the nature of light. Um, so, so, so out of, the, out of this goal of trying to understand electricity and magnetism, he understood something very important that he had no idea was connected with the first two. So that's an example of how, so okay, there's the rest of the t-shirt and then there was light. So, so this is an example of, of how a, a thought experiment can work. Um, and, and so the morals so far are, um, when you figure out how, when you have two things that should fit together and you don't know how, like electricity and magnetism or quantum mechanics and special relativity, um, when you finally figure out how they fit together, you learn things that you didn't expect, learn important things that you didn't expect to learn, like what is light and that antimatter exists. And so with quantum mechanics and general relativity, which are in some ways the hardest ones to fit together, we expect to learn even greater things. And in part, this has already happened. We've learned really, really deep and interesting things that we didn't expect, but we seem to be far, far from done. OK, um, so ah, you don't really need this slide, but just thought experiment again. So the idea is we're going to think about a black hole. We're going to ask, what does quantum mechanics predict? We're going to ask, what does general relativity predict? And if they disagree, then we have a clue. We have something interesting about how they, how to, you know, about what the next, what the more complete theory will look like. Like, so, 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 um, for the purpose of this talk, this is what a black hole looks like. So, general relativity says that gravity is the bending of space and time. And so this, this bent, this warped you know, surface is supposed to convey to you the idea of, of, of space and time being bent. And it's a very extreme bending, as you can see. And so this is the fate of very massive objects. A sufficiently massive star uh, will reach the point where its gravitational pull is so strong that nothing can resist it. And, and Einstein's theory says it will collapse and get smaller and smaller and that nothing can stop it until it is really a point of zero size, the singularity. Singularity has infinite density, infinite curvature. But there's another interesting point on, another interesting location on this space time, which is the event horizon. The event horizon is the point which, beyond which, if once you're past the event horizon, you're trapped. You're doomed to fall into the singularity. Even light, the fastest thing we know, can't escape. If you try to send a light beam out, sending a signal to your friends asking for help, the beam itself will bend backwards and fall into the singularity also. So the event horizon is the point of no return. By its, there's nothing special happening there. It's a, it's, the space there is just as smooth as it is everywhere else except the singularity. It's simply the point where the attractive force has built up so much that you're never going to be able to overcome it. So this, this is the, the classic picture of a black hole. And this is the picture that comes from general relativity. When you add in the other theory, quantum mechanics, 
you, new things happen. And so for it, it, without quantum mechanics, with a black hole, it can only get bigger because you throw stuff in, you throw stuff in, it grows and grows and grows. Um, but, but Hawking in, in 1974 discovered a remarkable effect, Hawking radiation. So one of the, one of the um, other funny things about quantum mechanics is that, that, again, so there's this randomness. And another manifestation of that randomness is that in empty space all the time, particles and antiparticles, matter and antimatter, is popping into existence and out again, just very, very quickly. And it seems strange, but we can see this happening through its indirect effect on the properties of atoms. And so all around us is happening all the time. And it usually is over very quickly. But if this happens near the event horizon of a black hole, one of the pair can escape the black hole and the other fall into the singularity. If they form near the horizon and one gets stuck behind the horizon, it will fall into the singularity and its partner can escape. And when it escapes, it must carry away energy and that means the black hole loses, ma loses mass. The black hole gets smaller rather than larger. And in fact, if you wait long enough, and it can be a very long time for a big black hole, eventually it will lose all of its mass in this way. It will radiate this Hawking radiation and bit by bit it will disappear until at the end you just have this outgoing radiation which might be light and other kinds of particles. So, okay, this, this is a great discovery. By itself, it's not a paradox. But if you push on it, if you push on this and think about it a bit harder, in fact, you, you, you run into two things that, that, well, that bother you. And so the first is the entropy puzzle. So this radiation that I just talked about that the black hole emits, is, it's, it's just like the radiation from a hot object, like this stove. It's a black body. It, it means that the black hole has a temperature. Now, now we know that, what, what is temperature? We know that what temperature means in ordinary matter is that the atoms, I mean, there's atoms basically, and it comes from the motion of the atoms. And so, if a black hole has, the temper, has a temperature, it strongly suggests that this temperature reflects that the black hole has some kind of atomic structure and the temperature that we're seeing is coming from the motion of those atoms, the, not ordinary atoms, some, something like atoms. The, 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 the temperature of the black hole is coming from the, the, the motion of these atoms. Um, and so this is now a conflict because general relativity says the black hole is this smooth, featureless space. Whereas quantum mechanics says no, it must be made of something smaller. It must have an atomic structure. So this is a, a clue and a puzzle. This, okay, this is, this is uh, not important. To, for, uh, not, well, it, the atoms are odd because they, unlike the atoms of ordinary matter, they don't live sort of inside, they live on the surface. It's an interesting thing, holographic principle, I'll say the word and move on. <laughs> but but I wanted, what I really want to get to is this information paradox that Keith, that Keith mentioned. And, um, so, so, so um, Keith mentioned throwing the white pages into a black hole. I actually am using Hawking's own book here, The Brief History of Time. Um, but again, the idea is that you throw, the, the, you throw something, it could, it, could be either, it could be anything into the black hole, and then you wait long enough and the black hole has turned into radiation. And what Hawking argued was that what you see in the end, the outgoing radiation, can't know about what you threw in. And again, it's because it's an event horizon. Once this book, or maybe you threw in some rocks, or a different book, whatever you threw in, um, once it's behind the horizon, it can't affect the outside. And so this radiation we have at the end doesn't know how the black hole formed. Now, that might not seem so bothersome to you, but in fact, it does, it's, it's not consistent with the laws of quantum mechanics. So the laws of physics usually tell you how things change in time. They tell you that if you start, if you do this and wait a while, this is what you see. But all of the laws that we, we now have in hand, especially quantum mechanics, they really work in both directions. Not only can you look at this and know that you'll have this eventually, 
But if you look at this, you can figure out what it came from. The equation sort of can be run in both directions. So the, and, so the equation, so, and so the equations of quantum mechanics really have this property. They can be run in both directions. And so they do, what, the, whatever you threw into the black hole would have to somehow be encoded in the outgoing radiation. And Hawking argued that wasn't possible, and so we had to modify quantum mechanics. A and this created a great crisis because the kind of, it, it's, a very, it, it, it's a very big change both in the mathematical and the physical structure of things to lose this property that the equations can run in both directions. It really isn't nice. And so it caused, it caused a, a lot of um, argument, strong feelings on both sides. And really for 40 years, we, we've argued about this. Um, so, so anyway, ah, so Hawking's quote again, this is, this is the origin of his quote. There's not only the randomness of quantum mechanics, but in addition, there's this extra loss of information that I just told you about. And um, I really admire, well, Hawking in general and this paper in particular, because he not only found this paradox, but he, he ex this, this quotation is, is really, it's from the very first paper. He expressed it in this very bold way that couldn't be ignored. He told us that one of our laws has to break down. He thought he knew which one, but either the basic framework of quantum theory breaks down and that theory works very well, or if the information escapes, it has to move faster than light because light can't escape from the black hole. If the information can, then information can move faster than light. So these are both very radical. And so for 40 years, we've tried to find the mistake in Hawking's argument. And we, we very clearly realized he, he didn't so much make a mistake as point out that our theories are not complete. There's something very deep that we don't understand. So about 20 years ago, we got what we think is a big clue. And, and this is, again, one of these, well, so, so, so um, there's this word duality. And I think the best way to explain what duality means is to go back to quantum mechanics and there's a very old question. Is light a wave or a particle? Well, I told you earlier it was a wave. I drew it like a wiggly thing. And, but, but in fact, again, this is a long-standing argument, and we now know that it's in some sense both. Quantum mechanics tells us that light oscillates like a wave, but it comes in little packets like particles. And, and whether, you, whether, whether it looks like a wave or a particle depends on really how you look at it, what question you ask. And this is not just true of light, it's true of electrons as, and other particles, every particle. So a duality is, is something that happens in quantum theory where you have two things that you think are different and they're really the same. And over the years we found this is a very general principle. We found lots of examples of this. Um, electricity and magnetism are not just unified but they're dual in the same way. But the greatest duality was found about 20 years after Hawking by Juan Maldacena, who found that this quantum mechanical black hole, this thing that we're trying to so hard, so hard to understand, this thing that, that um, we, we, um, we've been talking about, is dual to something which is, to us, much more familiar, kind of an ordinary gas of nuclear particles. So pictures are better than words. So here's my black hole. Here's my black hole. And here, is, and, and here is something which, again, to a physicist is much more normal. This is what you get if you bang together a couple of nuclei really hard. You get a hot gas of nuclear particles. And we understand this pretty well. And remarkably, by this duality, it's the same as a quantum black hole. Now, Keith mentioned that I work on string theory. I've written a book about string theory. I've managed to talk to you for a good fraction of my talk. I've never mentioned string theory. So I've got to put a few strings in my talk. And um, if you look very close, so, str so string theory is, again, part of this story. It's a part that I can't, don't have time to talk about in detail. It's a part of this story of unifying quantum mechanics and gravity. But, but it turns out that things work better if particles, instead of being little tiny points 
are little tiny vibrating loops. And um, so, so um, if you look closely, you will see that my equal sign there is a couple of little loops of string. And, and, and the reason that I've done this is because although strings aren't on the surface here, the surprising connection between these two things goes through string theory. And in fact, what we used to call string theory has really morphed into this much more general set of ideas about how gravity is connected to the other forces. And so, you know, as with Maxwell, as with Maxwell, this is a, who, who again found this surprising connection between light and electricity and magnetism. This is a completely unexpected be connection between gravity, gravity and quantum mechanics, and the nuclear force. It's just stunningly surprising. Um, and and it, it, it's taught us many things, not only about, not only about gravity, but about the nuclear force. And, and it's, you know, it, when you, as I said, one of the things uh, about fitting theories together is that you learn things that are surprising that you didn't expect to learn. And this is clearly an example of that. And it partly solves Hawking's problem because we know that nuclear particles behave, um, satisfy the ordinary laws of quantum mechanics. They don't destroy information. Uh, so in, uh, in 1976, um, Hawking, again, pointed out his paradox and said quantum mechanics has to change. In 2004, um, Mo he's a stubborn guy. I thought he would never change his mind. But in 2004, motivated by this discovery, he publicly changed his mind. And, and one reason this is a very timely talk is that in the last few weeks, I don't know, you may have noticed that Hawking is in the, in the news again, because after Hawking's, um, even after this duality, which tells us the information gets out, we still didn't know how it gets out. And so Hawking, um, just a few weeks ago, has announced that he, he and his collaborators know how it gets out. And there's a lot, I'll say a, little, a few words about that. There's a lot of skepticism about this, but it's, it, it, anyway, it's, it's an ongoing, ongoing story. And this provides, as you can kind of see, the atoms of which black holes are made. It fits together with other things that we thought we believed. This, but the reason this is a very lively talk not, is not just because of Hawking's talk, but because, again, we're still not done. We don't know where Hawking made his mistake, how the information gets out, and we don't understand really how this duality principle works more generally. How do we apply it to things like the Big Bang? And you might have gotten the impression from my talk, it's very useful to have a paradox, a puzzle, something that doesn't agree and really pushes you to figure out what's going on. And the good news is that we have a new paradox. Um, um, so, so, ah, so, so after Maldacena, after people decided ho black holes didn't destroy information, there were three things that were widely believed. One of them is that information is not destroyed. One of them is an observer who stays outside the black hole, doesn't see anything unusual, any violation of the known laws of physics. But also that any observer who falls into the black hole doesn't see any violation of the laws of physics. There might be something subtle in how this observer relates to this observer, but no single observer would see anything too disturbing. Um, and and, and um, what my partners in crime and I have shown or argued is that these three very desirable things are not consistent with one another. And um, actually, I don't see a clock. I think I'm in good, I think I'm in good shape. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, um, so, so, um, so the, the argument that we made, which is really Hawking's original argument, but run backwards, uses another funny property of quantum mechanics known as entanglement. So, I've, you know, quantum mechanics, I've told you a few things about it. I've told you um, there's randomness, and there's virtual particles, and also the equations like to run in both directions. Here's another thing about quantum mechanics. It has this property of entanglement. And since we started out with dice, I will use dice again. So, 
I want to imagine that I had a very special pair of dice with the following property. I roll the first die and it comes up some number between one and six. And then I roll the second die and it always comes up with a number so that they add up to seven. You could probably make a lot of money with a pair of dice like that, but you, 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 there's no way to build them because this is quantum mechanics. So if I roll a one, I get a six. I roll a four, I get a three. The dice are tied together in some mysterious way that if I, again, if I, if I, if I, if I measure one, I know the other, but I can't, you know, I can't affect the other one, but I can know what it will do. This is known as entanglement. And it's, 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 an, it's maybe the, the sort of central strange thing about quantum mechanics. So um, here's again my black hole and my Hawking pair, one falling in, one escaping. Um, and, and basically the way these are produced, they, they, they're, they're entangled. The, 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 the Hawking process produces them so that they're entangled. So I'll write A, B to say that these two are entangled. But now, if information is not lost, if you translate that into a more precise mathematical statement, what it means is, so B is the Hawking photon that's escaping. And now here, later on, is all the Hawking photons. If, if information is not lost, what that really requires is that B be entangled with one of the other Hawking photons. I'll call it C. But now there's a problem because the laws of quantum mechanics require that basically entanglement is monogamous. B has to decide whether to be entangled with A or entangled with C. It can't have it both ways. And whichever, whichever is true, something bad happens. If B is entangled with A and not C, information is lost. But if B is entangled with C and not A, something bad happens at the event horizon. Because when we break the entanglement between A and B, it's very much like breaking a chemical bond. It costs energy. And so um, if the entanglement is being broken between all of the particles falling in, the particles escaping, instead of there being a nice, smooth space, instead of someone who, so someone who jumps into a black hole will sail, well, according to Einstein's theory, if the black hole is very big, they will sail past the event horizon and eventually be crushed by the singularity, but nothing bad happens at the event horizon. But now, if, if, if the entanglement between A and B is lost, instead they're going to hit some kind of wall of energy and maybe even the end of space itself. And so in this battle between space-time and quantum mechanics, it seems as though the cost of saving quantum mechanics is that we lose a big chunk of space-time. Now, this is bizarre. Nobody believes this at first sight or even second or third sight because where did this come from? There's, the argument I gave you is an argument by contradiction, but there's, we don't know how this formed. And so um, there's a lot of confusion. So this argument is three years old um, and it's been the subject of at least 350 papers and there's still no consensus. If, if in fact there is this wall of fire or some energy hanging at the event horizon, what is it? Well, string theory, besides having strings, has these membranes. Maybe it's a shell of membranes. Uh, the idea I like, I wish I had some equations to go with these words, but the idea that I like is that these atoms of space, these atoms that tie themselves together into space, somehow in the inside of a black hole, they're in a new phase where they fail to form space. I think that has some ring of truth, but it needs equations. If there, is a, if there is a firewall, this is the truth. But actually, most people think this is crazy and they're looking for ways to avoid it. But if you look, if you look, the people who are trying to avoid that conclusion are going back to changing the laws of quantum mechanics. And they don't agree on how. There's a lot of ideas out there. There's an interesting body of ideas coming from several directions, not just the firewall. Which, which really say that this, this entanglement, this, this quantum property, which we've known about for 100 years, well, 90 years, but only in the last few years has it become so central 
in, in our thinking, that, that this entanglement is, is very tightly connected to where space-time comes from, that this entanglement, which I described as tying these dice together, in some sense provides the hooks that hold space-time together. And um, there actually are a fair number of equations that, that go with those words, but there is still, we're still missing the central principle that would make everything, everything fall into place. And another thing to say is, these are all scenarios, frameworks. We're missing a theory. And, and, and so, we're, we, you know, with, with, with the duality, we suddenly had a theory. We're, we're, we're missing the theory. But at some point, these are going to fall into place, and we'll have a theory that answers all these questions and probably some more, more besides. Now, coming to the end of my talk, there are natural questions that you want to ask that I can't answer. So what are there observation, observ observational effects for the real black holes out there? And also, are there any consequences for the early universe? The early universe actually has horizons just like a black hole does. And I can't answer those because as I kind of gave you the impression, there's a lot of ideas out there and they each say something different. We don't have a theory, so I can't answer that. Um, so to conclude, um, the, the, um, this, 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 as I said, this, um, well, when you have two theories that need to fit together and you don't know how, there's this tremendous creative potential, which in the past gave us light and antimatter. And in the case of gravity, again, we, we still haven't fully realized it, but we're, it feels like we're in the middle of a very exciting time. And so I'll close with another picture from Maxwell, which I like very much. So Maxwell, again, was the one with the thought experiment who figured out the extra term on the t-shirt. But he didn't just figure out the thought experiment. He also started to make models. He had this idea that what electricity and magnetism really were, were little wheels and gears. This is his picture. Little wheels and gears filling up space. And the picture looks kind of funny from a modern point of view, although he really had a very modern point of view. He, he understood that it wasn't the wheels and gears that were, that were important. This was a model that was going to lead him to the correct equations which he found. And I feel that in quantum gravity and in the story of the black holes and the firewall, um, this is where we are now. We're sort of at the wheels and gears stage of trying to uh, find a theory of quantum gravity and, 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 and we haven't really found the simple uh, place that we're gonna end up. So, thank you. If things are perfectly entangled, Professor Polchinski will answer your questions before you ask them. But <laughs> in case that's not the case. I probably maybe. could do this, having given the talk enough times, but I'll let you. So the floor is open for any questions. Yeah. So, Sorry. Is the microphone coming? So then is your idea that uh, that this phase transition, that this system that you described like a quark gluon gas, yes. that as something crosses that phase transition, that that transition is what creates a firewall that, that, that breaks like, the entanglement? That it's like a phase boundary, right. It's a very appealing picture. I mean, we know that ordinary matter has many phases. And if we grew up with just one phase, it would be hard for us to imagine any of the others. And so, if this is happening here, it puts, you know, we're trying to imagine phases that we've never seen. And, you know, again, maybe, I, I feel like this is one, one possible outcome to the way things, you know, to, to, to where things are going. Yeah. Question right here. Oh. Uh, that, show an equation, why is it that you cannot show an equation up on a screen? Why did we have to imagine it as art? Oh, um, um, this is a good question. Um, well, here, here, um, I'll go back to my equation and I'll take you through it a term at a time. Um, so, so uh, no, the real, the real, the real, I mean, 
you know, in an hour you can only convey so much information and I probably try to convey twice as much as I should, but an equation probably doubles the amount of information I would have to convey. And so that, this is not my, this, this is something that they tell you when you go to give lectures, you know. Yeah, so anyway, anyway, that's, it's, it's just, just the, the limit to how much, you know, one can convey in an hour and trying to choose the facts that are most important for the audience. But if you like equations, I'm giving another lecture tomorrow um, <laughs> that will provide the missing, uh, missing ingredients. Yeah? I'm sorry? One, one, one t-shirt one would not be sufficient, right. E equations are useful because you already recognize them. So when you show them, right. normally the, the person seeing the equation knows the equation and understands what the speaker is trying to this say. This is a good point. If you've never seen the equation, it doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, we had a, I'll come back to you, but there is a question there. Does the cosmic firewall theory mean that black holes can only um, evaporate and not accrete? No, 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 because, um, so, no, because um, the question, they can, you know, when, when you throw matter in, it gets stuck on whatever the firewall is. And, and so it's interesting because the firewall seen from the outside doesn't look really any different from what Hawking would have said many years ago. We already know the, the, the we already know that a black, so, so before even the information problem, we know that black holes can absorb matter and radiate energy. Lots of things can do this. I can throw something into a fire, it will burn, the radiation will come out. And so, and so um, you know, in some ways from the outside, a black hole is not that different from an ordinary thermal object. But yes, it can both get bigger and then smaller. black hole, if you throw information in yes. there, whether it's the white pages or your birth certificate yes. or maybe a flashlight, what actually happens in the, in the point of singularity? Is there, you talk about temperature, that good, good, good. There, there's something going on versus no, everything is dead, everything good. is lost. So you asked, you asked about the singularity. Yes. I said, I talked a lot about the horizon and very little about the singularity, which is, in a way kind of surprising because the singularity is the obviously bad, it's the obviously special place. And, and the real surprise which Greta Hawking's work is that the horizon is so special. Um, true, so the classic picture is that the information, whatever you threw in would fall through, whether it's white pages or, or um, whatever, and be crushed there. And in some sense the information would sit there fine. But because the information is, is behind, once it's behind the horizon, because it's behind the horizon, it, it, can't, it can't get out, it can't influence the later radiation. So, you know, it's interesting that we'd like to understand the singularity as well. Is the singularity the end of time? Is the singularity, um, there are thoughts that the singularity might be the beginning of a new universe, which expands again, which is really cool, but seems implausible. Is the singularity again a new phase? In some sense, the firewall is the singularity, ex in some sense, the firewall is the singularity expanding until it's, actually, I should, there is something I should say. Um, I realized that, that, that um, these, Pictures confuse some people because um, the firewall is not a ring, it's a shell. Because in this picture I can't show all the dimensions, I can only show two of the three dimensions of the, of the, uh, of the black hole. So the firewall you should understand is a shell, and so is the horizon, a shell, a sphere, uh, not a ring. But anyway, anyway, another way to think about this is that the firewall might be the singularity expanding um, until it fills the event horizon. And again, that, that has a certain appeal. Um, uh, so so, so that, that's, I, mean, I don't have much more to say about the singularity than that. Well, you suggested there's something going on. With the singularity. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, if, um, we know of other places in string theory actually where what, where what appear to be singularities actually do blow up 
into shells, but those are much tamer singularities than the singularity of a black hole. Um, there's a, there, but, but in fact, yeah, yeah, the, the, I mean, it kind of makes sense by Occam's razor that if we understood the one, we'd understand the other. And, and, and um, in some ways, the firewall, if it's true, answers both. It says the singularity has expanded out. Um, in, and it, again, it becomes like a phase boundary where ordinary space ends. Keith. First of all, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, it seems to me like I've read recently that there are some experiments that have shown that you can send information through space faster than the speed of light through entanglement. Uh, I want to know if that's uh, an accurate understanding or if it is, um, how come people aren't right, right. focusing more on information as being a key piece of the actual puzzle, the bigger picture? So. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but this is a very important, it, it's a very important fact actually in quantum mechanics that you can't do exactly what you just said. So entanglement is very strange because, um, let's come back to the two dice. So I have one die here and one die, you know, over on Alpha Centauri four light years away. I roll my die and the person on Alpha Centauri, I know what result they will find but I cannot influence their result. I cannot use this to send them a message. And, and it's, it's a, this actually again goes, this, well, this is, a, this, is, this, this is a very basic principle of quantum mechanics that although there seems to be this, you know, spooky connection between things, it is not a connection that can be used to send information. So you may very well have read that you could, but of course you read things all that you shouldn't, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't believe everything you read. Um, okay, so it's a very good question, but the answer is no, you can't. Yeah. We're gonna have uh, two more questions, one here and then. Uh, great discussion, thank, thank you. you. Does dark energy, dark matter enter into your discussions? Dark energy and dark matter, um, no. They are both extremely interesting. They also are both places that give us clues about things that we don't understand. I could tell you another story that would go on for an hour about how dark energy connects with string theory, but I won't. So no, they don't enter directly. They don't, yeah, they don't, the fact that, the fact that um, you know, dark matter is apparently a new kind of particle, dark energy tells us something about the vacuum, but it, it, it kind of doesn't link to what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Bianca. Professor Bruczynski, I have a question which is marginally related to your mm -hmm. most enjoyable lecture. Early on, you mentioned the measurements of the cosmic microwave yes. signals. Forgive me yeah, yeah. if I don't have the technical terms right, as, uh, as uh, an indicator and, in fact, uh, as uh, data relevant to the parameter mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. the very early life or the very early moments of the Big Bang yes, theory. Yes. But I, am, I seem to understand that those measurements have been called into question. Um, so so um, the, the the, there, are, there are several properties of the cosmic microwave background that you can measure. And, and the, well, they're all very hard to measure, but the one which is least very hard, the, the basic spectrum, has not been called into question. In fact, you know, it's just gotten better and better. In the last 25 years, we've gone from having a few very rough dots to, you know, they've just gotten better and better. So, 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 so um, this is very good. The, the interesting thing is that there's, um, there's several kinds of signals you can extract 
from the cosmic microwave background. And there's a second kind of signal which comes, so this is kind of the intensity of the radiation. The second kind of signal comes from the polarization of the radiation. If we could measure the polarization, we would learn something very interesting on top of this because we, we learn in some sense when inflation occurred. And so the, 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 um, the, uh, the experiment, the bicep experiment, which is the one which is about a year and a half ago, which reported a positive measurement on polarization um, and therefore evidence that inflation occurred very early, um, that, that went away. Actually, the, the experiment was beautiful. The experiment was right, but that is the measurement was right, but the interpretation turned out to be wrong. So, so the, the theory as a whole is fine, but, but, but it's, it's this one additional measurement, which is when inflation occurred, that, that, is, um, that, is, that was wrong. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. By the way, keeping in line with this particular slide, you'll see, if you look very hard, you'll see uh, Stephen Hawking's initials. Uh, <laughs> I used to know where they are. Oh, you, if, if you, once you see it, there's no way to not see it. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's an SH right there, oh, yeah, sort yeah. of in the center, a little bit to the left of yeah, center. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> of course, here in Minnesota, we have another SH working on the microwave background. Uh, uh, I, think, I think we're going to stop there. Let's thank Professor Polchinski again. If, uh, if anybody does have still some burning questions, we invite you to come up and, and, and ask directly to Professor Polchinski. Thanks.